My name's Daniel. I'm from the Physics and X-ray group um, in CID. And today I'm going to talk about graph neural networks applied to uh, particle tracking. So obviously we all want spaceships powered by dark matter and clothes made of Higgs bosons and uh, string phones, which are a new smartphone I'm trying to get off the ground running on string theory. But we won't have any of that stuff if we don't discover uh, new physics, and new physics lives at high energies, higher energies than at the LHC, perhaps. Um, but going to higher energies is not easy, and it's hard, and it, it's getting harder. So, for example, the LHC cost $4.5 billion, and here I've adapted a graph of projected um, discovery machines, colliders, detectors, um, in terms of their cost which, as you can see, as you go higher and higher energy, the cost increases as you would expect. This is on a log scale. You might say that while there is hope, um, it's less than linear, which is nice. So we're able to squeeze more and more uh, energy out of each dollar. But uh, nothing is, is that easy. So for example, with LHC Run 3 in 2021, there will be higher energy, um, but that brings more problems. So today I'm going to describe what are those problems that come with higher energy. Um, so how do we discover new physics? What is the tracking problem of new physics? Tracking is a hard problem and it's, it's getting harder. Um, but it turns out that graphs um, are a natural representa representation of those tracks. And we can use some nice techniques um, that have come with machine learning to um, analyze those tracks. And then perhaps we might have a road to fully learned tracks someday in the future. So the normal story is that uh, we like smashing atoms and that leads, leads to new physics and that big complicated um, collisions are useful. But in reality, uh, smashing things together is not the aim in itself. The dream would be to just produce one particle of interest, a Higgs boson or a tau, um, and study its properties. Well, these are heavy, for example, a Higgs boson is over 100 times the mass of a proton. So you need to introduce high energy into the system. You need to accelerate your proton um, to some high energy. But Einstein would say, well, a proton by itself doesn't understand its own energy. It needs to have a frame of reference. So typically, you introduce another proton. So they understand each other's energy. And because we're smart, we accelerate them in the opposite direction. So you get twice the bang for your buck. Uh, so collisions are often necessary. Um, they have produced some amazing discoveries like the Higgs, quarks, neutrino masses, and they could be used to discover new physics. Supersymmetry was obviously the draw card of the LHC and uh, is not yet discovered. Composite Higgs, axions, leptoquarks, these are all things that could live in the new physics uh, energy scale um, and collisions could help to discover those. But collisions are messy. Uh, the higher the energy, typically the higher number of fragments or jigsaw pieces that come out of these collisions. And the dream is to see every single particle that comes out of the collision, to be able to know what happened in the collision. Uh, and these leave tracks as they move through a detector. So you might ask, why not just look at all the particles? Why not just observe all of their tracks? Well, Quantum mechanics pops up, and Heisenberg would say that every observation is itself in interaction. So we can't just observe them at every time and place because we're making the situation more and more complicated. We need to observe them as few times as possible. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle with your eyes closed. And every time you peek at the jigsaw puzzle, the puzzle is becoming more and more complicated. So in reality, you want to observe the particles as few times as required and no more. So we want new physics which lives at high energy, um, which requires tracking millions and millions of particles through layers of a detector. So this is one collision, for example. Um, each collision has dozens of events. Uh, sorry, this is one event. And each second in the LHC produces tens of millions of collisions. So to detect it, we look at the particle a certain number of times as it travels through the detector. And each time it hits a layer, we register that as a hit on the layer. 
and we want to look at those hits and figure out what the track was in the first place. So the essential tracking problem of new physics is that we need a fast, high accuracy method to connect these hits together into tracks, determine the type of uh, particle that came out and the energy of the particle uh, from every event. But the current techniques are, the traditional techniques will probably not work in the next generation of, of colliders. I, I won't say that absolutely that they won't work. Um, but at least the typical plot is that as time goes on, energy goes on, uh, things get harder as these techniques scale quadratically, um, but our capacity for analyzing the events does not scale quadratically. We have a limited capacity, a limited budget, and so we want to get more out of each dollar um, and each CPU. So this will probably hit a limit in the middle of the 20s where traditional techniques will fail. So essentially we have these hits on layers. We want to join the hits into tracks. We want to convert the tracks into particle information and then do something Nobel Prize winning with that information. Uh, Vinkatesh has described steps maybe three to four, which is that you've been given some uh, physics information and you want to make sense out of that physics information. But we're going to focus on step two, which is we've received our hits from the engineers and we want to turn those hits into tracks. Well, it turns out graphs are a good way to represent tracks because they are inherently some sort of collection of hits and we want to connect those hits together. So this is some toy data that we've been generated. Um, we can see each of those hits coming from presumably a layer of the detector. You might combine those hits into some, in some clever or naive way um, and then hopefully the tracks live amongst those uh, graphs. So a graph is a collection of nodes um, and edges, which is a connection between the nodes. And then some jargon is that we have a doublet, which is a combination of two nodes and its edge information. We can give the nodes features. For example, we could give them a name, West Oakland, or we could give the edge a feature, which might be under maintenance across the bay, and the entire graph can have a feature, for example, uh, the very limited Sunday timetable. So if you want to join all those nodes together in some way, you might take a naive way and just join them randomly or fully connect them in some way. And then we want to figure out what is the true tracks through that graph. So hopefully we give each edge a score between 0 and 1 and then place a cut um, between 0 and 1 on what we consider as a true edge or a fake edge. And then the dream is to somehow recover the original information and distinguish those tracks based on the doublet uh, classifications. Uh, but particle physics is not like the BART. It's very complicated. And this is one event um, from a data set that we're using, which is called the TrackML Kaggle. Uh, competition data set, which is generated by simulation, which is nice, so that way we have the true information um, underlying the data set. This data set has about 8,000 collisions, and each collision has around 100,000, of order 100,000 hits. Um, so there are many ways to connect those hits into a huge graph, so it is a, a complicated problem. But luckily we have um, some new magical tools for example, a graph neural network. Uh, the GNN takes graph features, which as I described before, could be node level, edge level, or graph level. It does something to them. It runs those transformations through a neural net, and it returns the prediction that you want, whether it be node level, edge level, or graph level. And in many ways, it's a generalization of a convolutional neural net, um, which is based on the idea that simply connecting every piece of information together and feeding it into a neural net is not necessarily a good way to do things. Convolutional neural net relies on the fact that we can convolve uh, small pieces of information and return higher level information and that might reveal um, more useful features of the data. And a GNN generalizes a CNN. Most convolutions work on 2D pictures and the relationships between the pixels neighbor to neighbor. A GNN goes to n-dimensional 
and can have arbitrary connections between the neighbors, kind of like Johannes uh, talk about molecules connecting each other, not necessarily having to be in 2D. So a GNN understands the geometry of, uh, of a system. One piece of information that is um, very useful to a GNN is the neighborhood of each node. So a GNN uses the neighborhood and makes each node aware of its neighbors. And it's able to pass messages throughout the graph, um, which is called message passing, and it allows the graph to learn um, from area to area information from its uh, message passing between neighbors. We can combine this with another um, technique that's used in GNNs, which is called attention. I won't go into the, the details of these, but this basically allows each node to learn which of its neighbors to pay attention to. Um, and these lead to typically very good performance um, and predictive power. So for example, we have a, um, an event. And in the first iteration, which is to say before the graph has spread information around its network, it's not really able to differentiate between fake edges and true edges. But as it begins to pass information through the network, it's able to discriminate better and better between true and fake edges uh, until around eight iterations, which makes sense because a track is about eight to 10 edges long. And so you would expect after eight iterations, no more information should be spread um, we're really washing out the power um, of the GNN at that point. And once we've got our discrimination between true and fake, we draw some arbitrary line between zero and one. Say everything on the left is fake and everything on the right is true. And in that way, hopefully we've classified our doublets. So the question is, how do we then make tracks out of those doublets? Well, you might ask, why not just simply walk along the graph and choose doublet to doublet which to take? Um, and most of, this, most of the time, it, it can be a pretty easy decision if you're walking along one edge and hit the choice between 0 0.01 and 0.99 confidence, you are going to choose the 0.99. Um, but it's not always an obvious choice, and sometimes it can be ambiguous. But these scores, for example, 0.99, were learned by the GNN in the first place. So the question should be, why not teach the GNN how to walk through the graph and combine the doublets? Well, the problem is that the GNN doesn't know about combinations of, of doublets, or in this case, triplets. So x1, x2, x3 would form one possible triplet choice. Um, the GNN only knows about nodes and edges. So we need in some way to put this problem the triplet problem back into a graph problem. Um, and one way to do that is to combine all of the nodes, uh, all of the doublets into nodes. So we basically combine every possible combination of doublets that are connected into a new graph, a doublet graph, where each node now represents a doublet and each edge between the nodes represents a possible triplet choice. And then we plug that same triplet graph uh, back into the GNN without really having to change any of the structure of the GNN. So the aim of that would be to um, beat the performance of traditional methods, um, which naively one would think they can. They scale uh, better with the data. And then we either want to continue this process of going to quadruplets, quintuplets, and so on until we get tracks or we can hand off those triplets to some traditional uh, seeding algorithm, um, which are well understood, their complexity, and we can be sure, uh, confident in their accuracy. So a, the triplet GNN performs uh, very well. So here we have an actual event, simulated event, um, a quarter of the detector. We have um, every yellow edge is an edge that the triplet um, classifier has correctly predicted. Um, so we can kind of throw those away and look at the ones that it failed on. They're mostly towards the center of the detector. Um, and the reason there is typically that there is 
much more connection between the nodes in the center, uh, much more ambiguity. Even so, the triplet classifier tends to work better than the doublet classifier. So the doublet classifier makes its scores on the doublets and hands that information to the triplet classifier, which can then proceed to fix the original predictions. So in this case, every black line is a prediction that the triplet classifier has got right, that the doublet classifier originally had wrong. So in this particular example, the triplet classifier has come along and fixed 389 of the edges, um, and it's messed up 10 of the edges. It's worsened the results of the doublet classifier. So it's not perfect. Uh, then the question is, how do we make it better? So we can optimize the hyperparameters of the triplet classifier. Um, I'll put in a plug for weights and biases which uh, I've been using for visualizing and optimizing the hyperparameters. Uh, the hyperparameters are um, values that are typically chosen by hand before we train. So for example, they include um, the number of epochs that you're gonna train upon, the number of dimensions for each layer, um, and in a GNN, they include things like how much um, neighborhood information will you include uh, and how many times will you iterate through this message passing procedure. So these are all extremely um, powerful considerations when trying to improve the GNN. So that's one way to improve the triplet classifier. The other is to filter out certain s information that comes from the doublet classifier. So for example, um, the triplet classifier works very well. It has over 99% efficiency or efficiency is, in broad terms, how well it does, its accuracy. It's only ignoring 1% of the true triplets. But the problem is that it scales quite badly. Um, as you can imagine, if you're taking hits and finding combinations of two hits, that is a uh, exponential increase or a combinatoric increase, and then choosing combinations of three hits is another combinatoric increase. Um, so for example, we have in a typical um, example of the data, we have around 1,000 tracks, 6,000 hits, 28,000 doublets, and then 100,000 choices of, of three hits. So that's uh, bad, but one option is to throw away everything that the doublet classifier is pretty sure is not a true edge, which turns out to be most of the edges, because the doublet classifier is very good at distinguishing fake edges. So we can throw away um, five-sixths or so of the doublets output and in doing so we reduce the number of triplets down to the original order of magnitude. So in doing so we're not actually combinatorically increasing and we do have a sustainable process to go to fourplets, fiveplets, sixplets and so on if we wish. Uh, so to summarize particle tracking needs to be um, fast, cheap and accurate for the future where we are going to inevitably deal with higher and higher energies, higher and higher luminosities and more and more data. And the GNN is a good solution for that. Um, it's early days but the prediction of triplets is very accurate and it scales quite well. But yeah, as I say, it's very early days and we're exploring a lot of ways to optimize this and include more novel architectures and there are dozens of GNN papers published every week, so we are trying to think of uh, more things to include. And thanks very much. This is the Exatrax collaboration who is uh, working on this problem. And I'll take questions. You said that one of the limitations was quantum mechanics and the interference of tracks. Is that really true? Like, we don't have that kind of resolution in a, in a detector, do we? Where it can actually, where tracking can exactly or limited by quantum interference. Is that true? Uh, probably not quantum interference, but the idea is just that every new, um, every new measurement brings the possibility of a, of a branching of the track. Um, 
of interference and basically the dream would be to almost um, to barely interfere with the particle track but in order to measure the charge that it's dropping requires some interference with the track and so you have this this observation problem. Quantum interference is just a, I mean, it's true that if you, if you measure the track, you're, you're affecting the track, but um, I guess I'm surprised that, it, that it's, it's, a, it's a quantum interference and not just a classical, sure, if you, you know, scatter something off an electron, it's going to move. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. I'm just surprised. I'm not trying to, to, to argue one way or another. No, no, I, I understand. So if you consider some, a stochastic material interaction, uh, something like bremz long as a quantum effect, then, you know, yes, that's, that's something that happens all the time. Yeah, I, I guess it depends how you want to define sort of a quantum mechanical uh, resolution. But um, because it's such high energies, I guess it's a... It is a quantum field the theory is that phenomenon. For it to be an interference effect, you actually have to have like a, a track that is um, uh, I, I, I'll ask you more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interference might not be the right word. Thanks.